Hello, my name is John Pendleton, and I'm speaking to you from Zacatecas, Mexico, center of Mexico. And today I'm going to tell you of my project to attract and capture a real living pterodactyl dinosaur. Let me explain. Uh, I'm originally from Wisconsin. I've been a missionary here in central Mexico since 1984 with my wife and family. In 1991, I began developing a creation science talk. Uh, I gave my first one in 1994 to some 200 people in a church in Guadalajara. Uh, by the year 2000, I had seven half-hour uh, conferences, including one on dinosaurs. A Canadian friend of mine called me and asked me if there were pterodactyl sightings in Mexico. I said no, but I would check with my Huichol friend, Christian friend. Uh, the Huichol people is a uh, indigenous, uh, nat uh, natural, native uh, Mexican. Uh, well, Adolfo came to my house the next day, and I immediately went to my computer and lifted off some 12 drawings of pterodactyls, printed them out on a sheet of paper on both sides. I went with Adolfo and I said, have you ever seen any of these? He looked down the first page of six, no, turned it over and he pointed to the second one, uh, this image here that I'm putting up. Um, and I said, well, when did you see those? He said, when I was 14 years old. I said, well, what happened? He said, well, they were attacking our people and our animals and things. And finally, the, the leaders of our community said, that's it, that's enough. And so they went up to the caves nearby our community and built fires in the mouth of the caves. The smoke went in, the animals came out, they killed them all, big and small. And then what I said? Well, he said, since then I haven't seen him. He was 40 years old when I <clears throat> uh, made this interview with him. In 2007, I loaned this book to uh, the seven-year-old daughter, uh, our cleaning lady. Uh, I went into the kitchen and the work area in the kitchen that overlooked the dining area. I was making my coffee. And the lady came and looked over at the pages. Her daughter was flipping and said, oh, they see those in the village I'm from. I says, you're kidding. I says, you're gonna take me out to your village. So my male secretary and I, with this lady and her children, we went out to the to village, less than three hours drive from here, and I met different people that had seen the big bird. Uh, since I give creation, that was the beginning of uh, knowing that there are any at all in Mexico. Uh, since I give creation talks all over Mexico, I, I met people that told me that they've seen them. Here is a map of Mexico with a number of indicated uh, places where there have been sightings. Uh, here are some more specific testimonies. Uh, Adolfo saw this creature that he's pointing to in my book uh, in a river up in the mountains. Uh, he had occasion to cross the river some seven times in 15 days. People from the village came out and saw it also. Eventually it began to corrode away and the river carried it off. Uh, this bus driver was coming down a winding road in the southwestern part of my state here. Uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. He had his 19-year-old son and about a dozen adult passengers, and they saw this creature gliding uh, some 20 to 40 yards from the bus. <clears throat> um, David uh, was house-sitting for friends that had gone to the United States. Uh, about sunset, two teenagers come running up the street howling about this big bird. Uh, David looked up and saw it and wasn't impressed at first until it flew overhead and he saw just how big it was and ran inside. For An Andres, uh, it was harvest time and he was working in his field, he went out at three o'clock in the morning because there was a full moon, pleasant weather and he's organizing his bean vines together for the process of 
uh, harvesting them. And he thought on two different occasions that a shadow went past him. He said, no, that's, that was just me. Then finally he happened to turn and look and this thing was flying right at him. He didn't have any slingshot or machete and, and he actually had no weapon. And so he just hollered at it, threw the pea vines at it and everything, like in this picture here that I'm showing you. Uh, and eventually the thing left him alone. He identified in the book what uh, he felt that he had seen. Um, also, uh, a couple of years ago, it was a time of a lot of rain uh, in May, June, and July, and some other people said that they saw the big bird in a tree and that it jumped out of the tree into the ground, and then it flew off, and they figured if that thing jumped out of the tree with all this rain, the ground would be soft, and they were able to make these different impressions of the footprints there uh, in the ground. I'll put up some slides that will give you some better view of both the actual prints plus also the backside of the prints. Uh, now, if these are for real or not, I don't know, but there are just a number of things that have been just collecting here together of sightings in this area. <clears throat> the most amazing sighting is the next one. Uh, one day we were going out to the village with the cleaning lady and uh, my male secretary and you know, my wife and I were going that day and the male, the cleaning lady says, do you mind if my sister-in-law comes along? Oh, fine, come on. So we're driving out there almost jokingly, I say to this sister-in-law, I said, so what do you know about the big bird? She says, it almost carried me off about a year or so ago. I says, you're kidding. She says, no. She said, well, what happened? She says, well, I was visiting my parents and I got up early in the morning for personal necessities and uh, came out of the room and really, uh, unfastened the barbed wire fence of just three uh, barbed wires and relieved herself. And then when she was coming back with her back to the east, uh, she's fastening the wires, all of a sudden, whoosh, this giant shadow went right, right fast underneath her. The next thing, back to her left here in this picture, uh, these spindly pine trees, this thing was flying right at her. Since she was already kind of crouched down, she crouched down some more and avoided being grabbed. The creature went flying into the neighboring empty lot. She went running into the house. Since she got a really good look at this thing, I said, well, what did it look like? She said, it looked like the cover of your book. Uh, in a video interview that I did with my male secretary, I then asked her, I said, well, how big was it? And she put out her arms, as you see here. But I put out my arms. I said, well, this, this is almost six feet. She says, no, it was three to five feet bigger. This is amazing. This was real evidence. And not only that, but her father, her mother, and her brother, at different times uh, near their house, saw this creature over time. But coming up to the present dates, some of the most impressive cases of repeated sightings have been in the last few years near the village. It happens during irrigation time. There are central wells that service numbers of fields. Once a week, you get water for 24 hours to water your fields. The water's gotten from the canal uh, near your field by a siphoning method. Um, you, they need some 10 different men to work with you to get this done. Once a, once a row is full of water, you have to move the PVC siphoning device to the next place. And they have to work 24 hours, uh, and so they're working oftentimes through the whole night. But there have been so many sightings of this big bird, it is so big, that there are some men that will no longer work in certain areas, they won't even work at all because of the fear of these big birds. Now my plan is the following, is to uh, make a simple thing. Here's a picture of what the field is like. Uh, Andres has some property that's his that he's going to let us use. The idea is to make an area 
that's 33 feet wide by 66 feet long. Uh, the little red circles in this display are the places where we'll dig holes about 18 inches wide and deep, uh, fill it with a mix of uh, concrete and gravel, and we'll put pieces of rebar through the 10 feet high steel pipes, which will serve as posts for holding up the fence. The rebar is to keep the post from coming out of the ground. Uh, you see there's six different locations where there'll be cameras. Uh, these cameras are, are with an infrared flash and they have Wi-Fi connection to my cell phone and to my computer. For bait, we will have two lambs, two goats, two pigs, and lots of fish skin and guts. A five gallon bucket of pig blood and eucalyptus oil with leaves. Once the big bird comes, we will shoot it with a CO2 rifle that will shoot a syringe type dart with a tranquilizer drug. I also have a compressed air powered net gun that will shoot over the animal for him to get entangled in. Thirdly, we will cover the downed animal with a used pu publicity tarp and then wrap him up with ratchet straps. Can you imagine the impact in the world if we were to capture a live pterodactyl dinosaur? It would be for the glory of God. As you can see, the listing of materials that we'll need, we have uh, an estimate uh, of some $5,584 for, for everything. I also have good news that we've already received our first $500 toward this. This is such a great opportunity. I have been studying about this, getting reports since really 2007 in this area. And I believe now is the time that we can make it happen. We're really prepared to do it, do it right, and have this exciting uh, capture of a living pterodactyl dinosaur. Be a part. Here you can write to me questions and comments to my email, and I'm looking for you to become a part to GoFundMe. God bless you. Bye.